boy. We're going to talk about uh, garden design. Um, Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Marcus. And There's this, there's this learning and growth, and uh, I suppose sometimes my philosophy has been, if it dies, well, it just wasn't meant to be, and then you stick with the plants that survive, and uh, eventually you'll find things that actually just do so well, it, it gets easier as you eliminate the stuff that just doesn't work. Um, long term, so thinking long term, and it goes along with that everything dies thing. And I think learning to garden really is experimenting and just don't let yourself suddenly stop. Just keep trying things, keep going, and you'll, you'll gain those skills over time. And take notes. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a big thing is like taking the time to, to be documenting what you're doing is mm -hmm. really important. Otherwise, it'll come the second year and you'll make the mistake again and you'll start feeling really defeated by it when it's that you can really learn a lot from that and make the changes. And when you do make those changes based off your own observations, it can be really empowering. I think it's, I think note taking is one of the hardest things that farmers or gardeners leave out because they just want to work hard, hard, hard until the moment they're done their day. But it's also important just to be documenting and taking time to be reflecting and observing what is actually happening on what day and stuff. There's so much that we could talk about, but we really are going to focus on the design aspects today. So we've got four kind of main areas. Um, firstly, where do we want to put a garden on a property? Or where are suitable planting spaces? Uh, then which plants go in those planting spaces? So what goes where? Um, talking about composting, fertility and water, designing for those things in mind and then a little bit about just construction and different ways that you could build things. So that's going to be the focus and Marcus said we do have other workshops coming up. We've got one for planting. Talking about designing and just looking at your space and everybody has different spaces. You have from 12 acres to a quarter acres of this and probably even smaller you could have a balcony whatever whenever you're designing um, and one of the first things I like to ask people is how do you use your space right now like where are you on your property where do you go where do you move because if we design our gardens around where we are where we habitually move it means that we're going to be more in touch with our gardens or that we have that understanding um, a lot of people will build their like a vegetable garden way up the back you know so they never go there they get into their lives and they the garden just kind of is it's done it's it just doesn't get tended to um, so in permaculture there's this um, concept called zones and they divide them up into five zones Zone one is the area that, well, there's a little bit of differences, but zone one is basically the places where you go all the time. So where would you, where do you think, like on your property, where are you most of the time? You go in and out of your front door how many times every day? And if you drive, how many times do you walk from your front door to your car? So that's what I mean by zone one. It's like you're always, that's just your routine. You're always there. You might not notice. You might not even yeah. think of that as part of your property or a place where you could have plants. But that's zone one. And then your zone two is something that's a little bit more removed. Um, so people who have compost or chickens, you have to go out there once a day or the garbage, you know, whatever you're doing. It's just those spaces that you normally use quite a bit of time. So if you expand your thought about your property to that, what do you see? Zone three are, in terms of guarding, they're a little bit further away, but still places that you access and use regularly. So in the zone three zone, you might have like your 
main vegetable garden that you tend to, even if it's something weekly, that you go there, you work on your crops, you do a bunch of weeding. And then the rest of the time you just, you're not necessarily there all the time. Um, and some crops are better suited to that than others. And then zone four is seasonally or infrequently. So if you have a little orchard, you know, you're not in your orchard all the time. You go there to pick your fruit or do your pruning, right? So they're sometimes used. And then zone five is um, wild spaces, pretty much, or spaces that you're not intending to, to cultivate particularly, but they might be habitat for wild creatures or bees or lizards or snakes or things like that. that really loves the shade especially in the summer and that is something you also use really really often is uh, salad greens or lettuces really yeah because they hate the sun the sun and the hot weather salad That's greens do not like that, that at all so if you had a shadier spot by your front door what about putting some pots of like little mescaline mixed greens and then Every time you're walking in, you're like, oh, I guess I could cut a few leaves and we'll have salad. Whereas, you know, if they were way back there in zone three, we might just not have bothered. The fact that somebody says, I, I want a garden, I don't got tons of time let's say, or tons of space, let's say even, um, applying these to, and thinking, taking the time to think about where you're going and then just simply making your garden be in those areas. So if you're walking back to the compost in the back corner and this year you want to put lettuce, maybe just you want to plant little beds and then there's a pathway and it's just right next to it right there, you know, and so that you're observing it more and you're around it. Where are my pathways? And some people like they'll have a lawn like this and but they always do they just make this direct thing because maybe their compost is over there you can incorporate build that into a pathway and like you say put things on either side of it and then have this pathways that go off and as you expand it's kind of like this spider web design where everything is connected and it's actually those human spaces that are the most important in your design when you're thinking about where's my garden bed you actually first you want to think about well, where am I and where does it make sense where is it easy for me to access the garden bed so we did the, the shade plants what if you have a really hot zone one like right at your front door it's super hot and sunny Mediterranean herbs yeah sure oregano rosemary tomatoes Tomatoes, yeah, that's one came to my mind, cherry tomatoes, and especially if you have kids, and then they're just like, they walk out their door and they're eating cherry tomatoes all the time. They're gonna be full and there's gonna be like no, you know, no chips or that, because they're full of tomatoes. And thinking about things that need to be regularly harvested is also when you want to think about planting in that zone one and two. might have already seen or already be doing this at your home but a lot of times if you look at whatever the south facing part of your home is that's a microclimate too because of the heat that's coming off of it yeah. right so yeah. you see a lot of people plant their fruit trees they're very sun loving fruit trees up against the south facing wall of their home and there's been people back in Quebec when I lived there who were growing things that were completely impossible just mm -hmm. because they had really um, a huge amount of sunlight on brick and they were able to and they would extend the season because the nights when the frost would be happening everywhere else the heat from the wall would be emanating onto the plants mm -hmm. and so they were actually getting two to three weeks longer seasons which would allow them to get fruits uh, that they wouldn't be able to get if it was out in the middle of a one acre field or something so it's pretty fascinating how actually like the urban infrastructure of the city and buildings can actually be beneficial to create new ways of growing and, and growing outside of our the norms of a certain ecosystem. Like you said, the fruit trees, they do a lot better. There's some plants that, that won't do well at all if they're just in the normal place. They need those microclimates. And one that comes to mind is rosemary. So a lot of people 
have trouble growing rosemary mm -hmm. and it, it, partly in this climate it it likes drier really well drained soil so if you put it out in the middle of your garden or like a pretty kind of wet spot it won't do as well so sometimes mm -hmm. you think oh i just can't grow that uh or i'm a bad gardener it's just well it's just that the plant needs to be in a different mm -hmm. place and so that's tons of info about Okay, just in terms of again when we're looking at zones and it ties into microclimates, uh, other factors, like what other factors can you think of that would affect their sun and shade? Deer. Um, microclimate. Deer, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So there's going to be some spaces in your garden that you'll be able to fence for deer and some spaces that would really just be very hard to do that with. another one that's really important yeah. depending on where you are mm. is to think about where it's coming from and to observe I, a lot of people talk about when getting serious into wanting to landscape and, and create a farm or a, a serious garden and where you're going to invest your time and money into it to actually sit the year before and, and just just work on the design and planning of it maybe get your if you were going to till do that or if you're going to mulch do that so in your first year you're looking at you're looking at what happens during the season how, how much sun are you getting? How much sun is being blocked on the shoulder seasons from those trees that seem far away? Uh, and so along with wind, a very similar uh, effect is uh, noise. Noise or views, right? So, so you have a, a neighbor block that out, right? So uh, that's another, you can put a hedgerow, mm -hmm. but also I want to, just before we start to move around, talk about the multifunction elements. So you think about all these things that you want, you want a chicken coop and a greenhouse and a compost or a trellis for your kiwis. How do you integrate those elements so that they perform more than one function? So that, that neighbor that you don't want to look at or the noise, you build a trellis and you grow a plant over it, right? Or you have your greenhouse or your tool shed and you just create a little awning over the back of it, which is where your compost goes. So your tools, your compost, everything is performing multiple functions. And they're in one zone, perhaps, right? So you don't have to go cavorting all over your property, taking a lot of time to, to do things. You go to one place and things are... Some of those adaptations might be having cold frames uh, or so if you have a garden bed uh, you, and you have like some plastic or row cup right. or something you can put over it at night so that would help to uh, minimize the shift in temperature for those plants um, another thing that comes to mind is where the plants are so you get those really hot sunny days mm -hmm. Uh, everything heats up and then it cools down. It cools down amazingly. Suddenly yeah. it cools. But if you had plants like right in the middle of this terrace, mm -hmm. they're going to stay warmer a lot longer because of the heat sink effect. Mm -hmm. Right? Or the same thing if you had a, a hedge or some kind of a windbreak. So in, uh, here in the Alberni Valley, the wind comes up quite often mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So if you put that windbreak up, it won't, it won't, it'll just. You, help, you have to create microclimates mm -hmm. to sort of mitigate those, those shifts. Mm -hmm. And yeah, every plant will be different. Fabric-y cloth kind of stuff, it's woven and it can go over, but you can also do plastic. And you just go and you get simple little either PVC pipe or just these wires and they, you can buy them from most of the major um, farming supply places and you just kind of pu put it over top of your bed if you've got straight beds there's other ways that we can be going about it and then just lay this cloth over top and pin it down with some bags and, and that can really uh, increase the temperature by four or five degrees and can keep frost off plants in that in those early points you know so I kind of just want you to move around the front and the backyard 
um, maybe 10 minutes or so and look at all the spaces think about where the zones are think about the spaces that could be used for planting uh, and what sort of elements you could put in or how you could mix things up um, strawberries, rhubarb, um, some juniper, and uh, lavender. So those would be my, my things. For you. Well, I want to hear the ideas that we come up with for her. And then I guess in terms of incorporating um, like food plants into that, the simplest thing is to you know, start with what you have. You have a very beautiful ornamental garden. You can put plants in there kind of anywhere randomly. Just mix up your vegetables in with your um, flowers. Um, what really about some more herbs, like your herbs. flowering and, herbs, and yeah, things, absolutely. You know, for cooking and things like that? Yep. You could make, yeah, you could well, do the herb bed just from where you come from the car into the, into the house. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. pretty much level from here to here and what I would do is I would place say a rock here and a rock there and then just swivel this and does it go up here does it go down here so this is how you make some really beautiful curved paths where you find the contour so you stay level so you're staying level and so then I would have a rock there and a rock there and now a rock here and I'd flip it around and you see I'm actually coming up now a little bit. Well, maybe not. <laughs> right? So you're pretty straight. You can have a straight garden here really easily. But in some places, like right here, you'll actually end up with a curved garden to be on contour. And the other thing is that those curves are actually aesthetically really pleasing as well. Mm -hmm. They like it. And in fact, it's almost would match this uh, the patio yeah. here. One of the things I'm always thinking about is if you're going to be coming out and you're going to be trying to do most of your stuff with hand watering, say your garden's small, is to ask where that hose is going to be dragging and what it's going to be dragging across. Because too often I've seen these spots where I, I actually want my hose to be over by the tree, but there's all these beds in this way. There's, there's stuff over here and when I'm not paying attention I carry it and my poor seedlings get crushed. One trick to that is is to be designing your garden in this way. If you're just gonna keep it there and you don't wanna invest in, in more um, water related things, maybe I'm gonna run a straight path straight down here that's gonna allow me to uncoil my hose and get it down here. Then if the beds are running on contour, what I'll do is act I'll actually pound a wood stake about this high right at the front of each path. So that when I come here, I would just say, okay, I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm gonna make a path that comes straight through here. And then as my pathways are going this way because I have beds at each one I would put this in the ground so that when I'm coming out with my hose I would go around and then walk down the pathway without crushing stuff so this is something to really think about and then whether or not you want to have your paths being straight uh, your beds being straight or if you're interested in more curves things along these lines will also uh, inform which kind of irrigation you're going to be using because it's important in the summertime 
Um, this is just a very simple and very uh, cheap irrigation system that I got from Iritex in between Parksville and Coombs. These things were only like seven or ten dollars each and I put them on a stake and what I like about them is they're up higher and they're circular. They just come out and it just slowly moves and it covers a pretty big amount of space. Probably two of these could cover that whole half of the yard. And so this is good. This is top-down irrigation. So it is wasting water, especially on windy days. And I use it just when I plant my first seeds. So when I sow my first seeds, I'll use this for the first week to two weeks um, to be watering. And the reason why I like it to be high is because a lot of the other ones that are really low to the ground, when they're either going ch -ch -ch -ch, doing that um, impact sprayers, or even the back and forth watering, right? It's hitting plants that are low to the ground. So then you end up having to find spaces to put it where it's not gonna come and spray right against the plant that's right next to it. With these, why I like them is I can plop it right down in the middle of wherever my garden is and it's from above moving. So it's just, this is just one system to think about that is really useful. And I like these because you can actually take it apart at all these points. They're very simple. You could rebuild it very easily, but um, yeah, very cheap way to have something set up. I do everything on timers and uh, I have the timer over here because when it comes to gardening and comes to farming, you want to always be trying to think about how you can minimize work that isn't directly bringing food into the house, right? Like I want to be harvesting and planting. I don't want to be weeding and watering all the time. And if I am going to be watering, I want to water in a way that's not wasting very much. So I choose a timer because I want the water to come on at five or six in the morning before the sun comes out. And I want it to water and I want the water to seep into the ground at that time. I don't, and I don't want the sun to be just baking it away, right? Because it's a waste. I also don't want to be getting up at 5.30 in the morning and watering every single day, right? So a timer, these are usually around $30, is really useful and they even come with different zones. So you can plug in, you know, one here and one here, depending on if you've got an area that wants a lot of water or doesn't want a lot of water. So I highly recommend timers. Um, and this stuff's really incredible. I started using it last year, it's drip tape. I don't know if, how many of you know, but it's um, only gonna really be useful on straight rows. And so what you do is you, it, it gets plugged into a whole system, but it's basically attaches to this at the end and they have like little emitters that plug in and it runs just right down the length of your bed and there's little teeny slits all along the tape that are just dripping out water very slowly. Um, and I'll put, Three of them down. I have I have uh, three foot wide beds approximately. That's just the, the that's the way because I measure how far I can reach into something without it feeling uncomfortable, and then I times it by two for when I'm on the other side. And I'm like three feet. That's good for me. That's how much I can reach where I'm not overexerting myself. And then I think about I'll put three of these lines down, and I just research to find out that how much water they'll cover. And these save a lot of water and they also put water where you want it deep into the ground because they just keep dripping and pushing it down it was the best gardening i ever had last year was with using um using this stuff so so are they buried no nope they're not buried they're, they're right on surface. yeah right on the surface and uh uh in in i i have it these are eight inch spacings where the little little emitters they're just like these little cuts in it that just drip out if you can get six inch, I think it's better personally. And from what I've researched, I find that to be the case. But uh, so these are just a couple different options. You'll also see stuff called soaker hose mm -hmm. and that stuff you can curl around stuff a little bit better. I find it to be a really junky product. Um, the thing with a uh, soaker hose, as soon as you rip it, you're done. Whereas with this, and I did rip it, if you, if you do happen to cut into it and it starts dripping, uh, you just take a pair of scissors and cut at the spot and just come back to your old stuff cut a piece like this and it actually slides over both ends and you can reconnect it and you're good to go again. So you can fix it real fast for nothing. Pile, every yard should have a big pile of leaves in a corner somewhere and you just pile them there and then in the summer when you need the, the mulch you just come in and use that. Leaves are one of the best. Any organic matter, just start collecting it. And it's interesting, once you finish off that pile of leaves, look at the soil under where those leaves were sitting. It's teeming with life. That's what you want in your garden, right? So you put the leaves on your garden and that happens in your soil there. Um, the I other- I actually use cardboard. Cardboard is a cardboard great mulch. Really yeah. Effective. And so yeah. in paths, 
cardboard everywhere. Um, you could even cut cardboard out around plants mm -hmm. and put it into mm -hmm. plants. Grass mm -hmm. clippings work well. Um, I personally usually just say just leave the grass clippings on the grass and mulch them in. It's, it's good for your grass that way. Um, and then talking about getting into fertility, there's a lot of plants that you can grow to become mulch. And that is, is a really good way. So let's talk about fertility. So we'll talk about the plants because we're here right now. There's some plants that are called, they call them dynamic accumulators. Basically they're plants that really have a strong tendency to pull out nutrients from the soil. Specific nutrients. Some plants, they pull up calcium. Some plants pull up potassium. Uh, they tend to be kind of deep rooted, so they also penetrate into the soil. So they, these plants kind of harness all these nutrients in the soil. They bring them up into their leaves, and then you cut the leaves down, and you can use them as mulch. So basically, you're, you're, what you're growing is your compost, or you're growing your mulch. Kind of compost plants are called nitrogen fixing plants, and those nitrogen is the nutrient that it's kind of helps to create the lush greenness in plants and lots of quick growth. So some plants have nitrogen fixing bacteria on their roots, and they specifically attach bring nitrogen into those plants. So they're called green manures.